This is The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Just back from Syria, we are joined by Patrick Coburn. He's a correspondent for The Independent and was awarded Foreign Reporter of the Year at the 2015 Press Awards. He's the author of The Rise of the Islamic State, ISIS, and the New Sunni Revolution. Patrick, good to have you back safely. Thank you. Patrick, first, give us your observations on the ground while you were there. Well, you know, Syria is mostly destroyed uh, now as a country. There are 22 million Syrians and 4 million of them, are, of them are refugees outside the country and 7 million are displaced within the country. I was in the, the northeast, which is in the uh, most recently, which is uh, Kurdish controlled and stretches uh, a long way uh, along the southern border of Turkey. And this is meant to be one of the uh, safer areas of Syria. But, uh, you know, it's really very purely comparative. I mean, Kabani, the town that uh, Islamic State tried to capture in a siege of four and a half months, about 70 percent of the town is destroyed, just enormous heaps of pulverized concrete everywhere. But even in other villages, you know, one town I was going through that um, Ras Alain, which is meant to be pretty quiet, but it was just after I got into a town, I saw on the road ahead suddenly there was a. I heard what I thought were gunshots initially, but then I saw a big plume of smoke, and it turned out there'd been a suicide bomber. And I think it's uh, three people were killed, and then shortly afterwards there was uh, a bang behind us, and the entrance to the town, which we just passed through, that the uh, Another suicide bomber on the motorcycle that blew himself up, didn't kill anybody. Uh, this is meant to be in a fairly safe town. And uh, other places, even where there's no destruction, I was in some Assyrian Christian villages in the, uh, near a city called Hasaka, and uh, there isn't much destruction in the one town I was in. Uh, uh, but everybody's fled, 90% of the population has fled. Um, it's all empty, you see, and shops boarded up, uh, gardens with overgrown trees in, you know, very few people around. And there's a sort of atmosphere of, uh, of terror. And uh, where are they going, Patrick? Some within the country, you know, what, what they deem safer areas. In this particular area, it's a town called Taltamir I was in, um, with a lot of Christians, a lot of them they gone, they'd gone to Germany, they'd gone to Sweden, they'd gone to Turkey. Um, I talked to the mayor of one of the villages there who said oh, he thought they should come back. But then it turned out that he was planning to go to Germany himself. So it's kind of a mass exodus. Uh, the thing is that an area may be quiet today, but, you know, something may happen tomorrow. And I noticed a couple of days ago, sorry, today, that it was uh, Islamic State had executed... Uh, three uh, uh, Assyrian Christians who may have take, taken prisoner earlier in the year. These sort of things sort of spread, uh, spread terror everywhere. People talk about sleeper cells everywhere in Arab villages. Uh, some of this is true. I think most of it's probably paranoia. Um, going through one village, uh, you know, suddenly there were lots of uh, soldiers on the road. These are Kurdish soldiers saying they'd heard that uh, Daesh, as they called Islamic State fighters, uh, had the village. They were looking for them. Uh, another place I was driving through another town called Talabiad, which was one of the border crossings to Turkey that uh, the Kurds captured earlier in the year. And suddenly, a woman ran out in front of our car. Now, I was going up to the, the border crossing to have a look at it. And there was a police car sort of guiding me. Anyway, she ran in front of the police car and said, there's a Daesh, an Islamic State guy, has just run through my garden. Um, and then the, the police got out and, uh, and decided, yeah, there were some, a lot of abandoned houses that have Islamic, uh, maybe some Islamic State fighter was, uh, had been hiding there. Uh, so all these, these are so little incidents, but they all create an atmosphere of fear. And uh, what kind of uh, comments are there in terms of the Assad government and this, the role that the state is playing at the moment? Well, this is a Kurdish area, but it's an important one because they claim they've got 50,000 soldiers 
fighters. Maybe it's not that big, but that's what they claim. Uh, and they've been very effective in fighting Islamic State, uh, partly because they're very well disciplined and uh, well organized and committed, and partly because they have the support of U.S. Uh, airstrikes. And I was talking to the president of uh, uh, this area, about two, two, three million people in it, uh, uh, and he said, um, you know, yeah, Assad government pretty bad, but uh, Islamic State, ISIS even worse. Uh, he said, you know, we, we just can't sleep easy so long as one of those guys are, are is alive. Um, so for the Kurds, who, you know, suffered a lot and were marginalized under the uh, Assad government for uh, decades, but even so, they think if Islamic State comes, they'll be driven out. They'll all be turned into refugees. Patrick, uh, two days ago you wrote, uh, Russia in Syria, Russian radar locks onto Turkish fighter jets as Moscow steps up airstrikes ag against opposition targets. This was the title of the article you wrote in The Independent. Um, the Russians have, have been attacking and uh, airstrikes and, and now uh, from the sea that they have also been trying to, I think, take out opposition uh, to Assad, uh, but is there any indication that they're actually fighting ISIS here? Yeah, there have been a lot of airstrikes around Palmyra, and I think that uh, um, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is pro-opposition, I think uh, yesterday they said there have been 34 strikes there, and to the west of there, um, there seem to be a lot of strikes there. It's fairly clear that the Russians are attacking ISIS, and they're also attacking Jabhat al-Nusra and Arar al-Sham, which are, uh, um, Jabhat al-Nusra is the al-Qaeda representative, Arar al-Sham is not much different. Um, these are all from some in the Western media described as moderates. I don't know why, because I mean, they really are not. You know, they're very much the same ideology as Islamic State. A lot of their uh, commanders are former Islamic ISIS people. Uh, so they're really very much the same. And they're seen uh, by the Kurds in the, where I was and in Damascus as being the same. And Patrick, the Turkish opposition to using their airspace and uh, the recent uh, uh, criticism against Russia launched both also by Erdogan as well as NATO. Uh, what do you make of the comments, and uh, how is all this going to uh, evolve over the next little while uh, in a very tumultuous war zone? It's a great big mess, which is getting messier by the day. Uh, obviously, the Turks don't like uh, Russian uh, aircraft and uh, missiles sort of getting very close to their frontier. On the other hand, uh, the Turks have been uh, fairly openly assisting uh, some of the uh, uh, extreme organizations operating in northern Syria. So they're not in a great place to uh, position to protest about uh, uh, people um, uh, uh, crossing their frontier. Uh, question is, is there much they can do about it? It sort of looks not very much at the moment. Um, but we'll see. Uh, but. You know, this whole area now is getting sort of extraordinarily confused because you have the Russians getting involved, the Syrian army attacking, the Turks are involved, um, and the Syrian Kurds, who probably have the most, uh, not the largest, but the most effective army in Syria, want to attack west and close the last border crossing that Islamic State uses into uh, Turkey. Uh, that, again, would... Uh, upset the uh, Turks. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary situation. You know, it's like sort of somebody compared it to sort of three-dimensional chess with nine players and no rules. Um, and so it's, uh, it's uh, basically unpredictable. And the most uh, contentious point uh, all around seems to be still the Assad factor. Um, and I, I noticed that you wrote, there are no easier uh, solutions to Syria. 
uh, as it is being torn apart by a genuine, multi-layered civil war with a multitude of self-interested players inside and outside the country. You wrote, if Assad dropped dead tomorrow, Syrians in his corner would not stop fighting knowing, as they do, that the success of an opposition movement dominated by ISIS or al-Qaeda clones, such as uh, Ba'at al-Nusra, would mean death or fight for their livelihood. Now, what, uh, given this description, um, if Assad uh, is not in the picture, uh, and if the Russians are ex actually successful in what they want to achieve, at least what they're saying they want to achieve, which is to hold up the Syrian state in order to not create a vacuum, which is what Putin had said uh, at the United Nations last week. Um, uh, what are then, if, if, let's say, Assad is no longer a factor, is there a, a, a way in which uh, a political solution can be imagined at this point, and I say imagine only because we are such a long way from it. It's difficult to do so. You know, people say Assad there, Assad not there. It's well, you know, it's really a way of saying could power be shared. You know, this is a genuine civil war. There are people on both sides who uh, are going to fight to the end. Uh, whether it's on Assad's side or on the opposition side. Uh, you know, it's a mistake. I think all the sort of interpretation, what politicians say, treating it as something which isn't a civil war, uh, just is uh, completely unrealistic. Um, you know, how could this be, uh, peace be returned? It's very difficult to see how it can be done without defeating the Islamic State, because after all, the Islamic State has no plans to negotiate with anybody who wants to kill them. Uh, and uh, so it's difficult to see peace coming without the war first escalating against Islamic State. Um, you know, could power be shared in the long term? I suspect it will, you know, but probably in a very unsatisfactory way that we'll have different parts of Syria with uh, different warlords uh, ruling them. We'll have power shared geographically, but we won't have power shared at the center. Uh, if Assad goes, would the Syrian state fall apart, as happened in uh, Iraq in 2003 after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein? Um, and. As everybody recalls, the U.S. dissolved the Syrian army. But, uh, you know, the Isra Iraqi state was already falling apart. Uh, would that happen in uh, Syria as well? And you'd have a vacuum that would be filled essentially by uh, ISIS and other extreme uh, fundamentalist organizations like that. Um, uh, it's difficult to see peace coming. I mean, uh, the, the only slight hope I have is that the U.S. has stood on the uh, sidelines, the Russians likewise. Now that they're both involved, there may be more international engagement in setting up real negotiations uh, to bring some sort of peace. Previously, uh, you know, we had uh, negotiations, meetings, uh, but they were never going to get anywhere, and neither the U.S. nor the Russians were trying that hard to deliver their local allies to have real talks. Now, it seems clear to me that the Americans at this point uh, is only interested in continuing to uh, continuing the havoc uh, the country is in and continuing to bomb under the auspices of trying to attack the I I.S., but uh, the Russians are uh, on a different end game, it seems to me, to hold up and strengthen this, uh, what exists of the state of, um, of Syria. Now, are there any uh, hope of them coming together and uh, coming to some uh, negotiated terms in terms of their coordination and the objective here to fight back the IS and, and not the state? It's difficult to see it happening at the moment. We'll have to see how it plays out in the next few weeks. I mean, lots of things could happen. 
um, if the Kurds attack uh, and capture more of the frontier, then there's a possibility of Turkey intervening. Uh, uh, will uh, um, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf monarchies give more support to their local allies in the north? Um, things like that. Uh, it also just depends what ha what happens on the battlefield. You know, does the uh, Syrian army make gains this time around, or do we have the same stalemate continuing? Um, you know, I think that what I'd like to see would be some concentration on ending, you know, this terrible situation. You know, this is the destruction of a whole country. You know, this sort of thing just doesn't happen very often. You know, you had it in Cambodia in sort of the late 70s. Um, the, but uh, this sort of complete destruction that you see in Syria, uh, which, you know, which used to have a pretty reasonable standard of living, is uh, an extraordinary event. And, you know, the world has really sat by and not really done nothing about it. Now, it's clear that the Russians have actually stepped in in order to bring about um, uh, some solution, obviously, to what's going on. But wouldn't Russia be able to bring some of the parties to the table um, if they were to take the uh, Assad uh, leadership out of the um, negotiations? I think they can get rid of Assad just like that, you know. Um, it's... <sighs> You know, there's a Western attitude towards Assad which is contradictory, which is, what, first of all, to treat him as the demon king who controls you know, everything in his areas, and then treat him as somebody who's going to be easily removed by the Russians. You know, so these things are, uh, contradict each other. Uh, I don't think the Russians could remove him just like that. Um, and I don't know just like that. But... At the same time, his government, his regime, is very dependent on them. So he'll have to, to up to a certain point, do what they ask. Um, and and know, because of that dependency, isn't he able to perhaps negotiate with the military, you know, still meet the objective of upholding the state and keeping the structure of the state intact, including the military, um, and, uh, and still uh, put Assad's leadership on the table for negotiation? Well, yeah, but I mean, that might happen in the very long term, but I can't see it happening immediately because nobody quite knows if Assad goes does the military dissolve? You know, the state is rather built around the Assad family. Um, so the idea that you can keep the state but get rid of Assad, well, in theory, maybe, but can it be done in practice? Over what period could it be done? Because after all, he has no plans to go to quietly. Um, and he represents a certain constituency in uh, Syria. I think that with the Russians more heavily involved, yeah, they have more influence in Damascus. Uh, if they're interested in uh, negotiations, then they may be able to uh, get Assad to genuinely talk during negotiations. We had negotiations at Geneva uh, some time back, but um, and uh, the U.S. and Russia put uh, pressure on their local allies to turn up which they did, but they were basically didn't want to agree anything. Each side was, at that point, was hoping for military victory. Now, maybe if we have negotiations again, we have greater pressure from Moscow and Washington, there would be real talks that we might begin to have some substantive agreements. Very well, Patrick. Uh, we will be watching this, as I'm sure you will be, and hope to have you back very soon again. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.